supposed to go up instead of what it normally does. Uh, yeah, well, I will not be afraid. Is that right there? And then provide so the second, is like the way. Each time. Okay. Yeah, the second, yeah.
hot this week. I hope you're ready for that. And today's call to worship comes from Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Oh, now that I'm on. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> I was just waiting until everybody got seated. That was just a practice run. Rehearsal. Rehearsal. Sometimes it's on the fly. It's all right. We're glad that you're all here this morning, and we're excited for what God has for us today. Search, my, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offense, offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's worship in song this morning. Good morning, everybody. This is a effort at seeing how much I can carry at one time. And I think I did well. I don't think I left anything back there. Josh, would you come on up, please? Actually, let's bring the whole family up. <laughs> Oops, got one in the carriage, so we got to back up. I'm so glad to see everybody made it this morning because we all want to see your shiny faces that, am I close enough here, that uh, we're not going to get to see much anymore unless we go visit you or we go to district things together. So we're going to miss you all. So we got lots of goodies. All of the little ones absolutely love marshmallows. So we have marshmallows. Is that good? <laughs> I've had a cold all week, believe it or not. Josh, I have um, molasses cookies for you because when I gave you molasses cookies, he told me he liked everything. And then I heard, but those are absolutely my favorite. So <laughs> did any of anybody else get molasses cookies last time? <laughs> well, I made chocolate chip cookies also. So. Kaylee, I know, uh, Callie, it's Callie, right? Kaylee, I know you can't have those cookies, and these are the cookies we had for you in Sunday school, so you can have these cookies. She has special cookies. Gosh, for your office, we have a bucket that says five cents for whining. And I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven wines in here already, so. <laughs> and it says, pray without ceasing, a new plaque for your office. I'm going to leave these here if you want to take them now or come get them later. I don't think they're in the way. So we want to appreciate you and give you a big round of applause. 
And as, as I was asked to do this, I'm saying, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? But Josh, you know, I'd like to pray for you. And I'm going to stand here and pray because I don't want any of you to catch whatever it is I got. But it isn't COVID. It is runny noses and other things that go with it and no fever. <coughs> Dear Lord, we pray for the Potter family as they head out on this new adventure, following your will, praying that you guide their steps, keep them, bless them as they go forward. Amen. So glad to see you all here this morning and glad to see you at home, those who couldn't make it here. We're just glad you're here with us in uh, spirit and you're able to watch us. So um, Donna wanted to make sure we pointed out some things as your board update. It's in the back of the bulletin if you have those with you. Uh, just some quick things. Um, we already kind of gone through some of this. So if it's like a review until we get to uh, the July 8th through 21st, that the board is setting aside a time of prayer, asking the congregation to also be in prayer about um, the, the people that we've been looking at for pastors. And then there will be a regular board meeting coming up um, to determine what's next, and we just want to make sure that we're all part of that. But on the bottom is the SDMI update. Sunday school and Bible studies hopefully will be starting August 2nd, as long as we, the Southwest District Health um, group in this area, stays at stage four or higher. Sunday school and the children's department teachers have been redistributed for fewer and smaller classes, and it shows in there what that looks like. There will be children's church and Lakeview Little Ones on a regular schedule like before. And Josh Gates is going to step up as the NYI president. He's going to step up and, and handle the teens, while um, others are going to take over for the, the children's department. But he's still going to oversee, so we're glad about that. And nursery will be open. So we're excited about that, so more people can come and bring their kids. But we have been enjoying the, the little cries during service. <laughs> it has not been an issue. We have really enjoyed it. So thank you for bringing your children, those who have. Uh, future celebrations, uh, the Potters and the Harmons still both need parties that we can really celebrate. Pastor's retirement and Josh is going away. So we'll be able to um, hopefully sometime in the future, once we're more on a normal, uh, be able to have those for them. So we'll keep you updated on that. So just a reminder, as usual, in your bulletins are the little pieces of paper to tell us who you are and what's going on in your lives. You can write on the back um, some prayer requests or praises. And um, on the front, if you are new, you can tell us who you are on there. Those of you at home, you can text me, email me, however, to tell us what's going on in your life so we can update our prayer requests. Um, Sunday school, as I said, might be starting in August, hopefully, so just plan on that. And then um, the offerings, we just continue. If you want to continue doing them through the mail, that's fine, but we also have offering plates at the back of the sanctuary when you come in or when you leave. Just go ahead and put them there, and they'll be getting where they belong. So we thank you so much for your faithfulness and how well this has all been going, even in the midst of this time that's so different. Um, you guys have been faithful, and it's just a blessing to us to see that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We thank you for this beautiful weather, and we pray that you just continue to be with everyone who's here and everyone who's home watching, that you just help them through any time that they need with you, that they get to spend it in you and be able to see your joy and your love and be able to spread that to others around them. Thank you, Jesus. Your name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture reading continues from last week in Romans chapter 8. This time we're going to start with verse 12. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, nature you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God and daughters of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are our children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we then wait for it patiently. The word of the Lord.
Would you join me in prayer this morning? As David prayed, Lord, in Chronicles, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father. You have adopted us into your family, and we are yours forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. We are yours, O Lord. You have created us. You have brought us together as a family. You have made us yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and give strength to all. Lord God, we are so aware of our weakness, of our inability to change the things that we face in this world, because yours is the power and the might and the ability to change not only our world, but to change our hearts. And God, we place our hearts in your hands. We ask, Lord, that one by one, you will change our hearts to face the things that come our way this day and the next day and the day after that, that your power will be manifested in us, Lord, in such a way that everyone we see, every person we touch from six feet, Every life that we impact is aware that you are God, that your power is made great in our weakness, that no matter where we go, no matter what we face, we do not face it alone. Thank you, dear Lord, for being with us in all these things. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name, you have a plan and a purpose for your church, Lord. Not just this building, but the church you have gathered together and each person who is gathered in this place, who is sitting in front of their laptop or their phone, each person that claims Lakeview Church of the Nazarene is their home, Lord, you have brought us together for a purpose. And Lord, I confess, 
we're a little uncertain about what that purpose is in these days as we search for a new pastor. We ask your blessing upon Mark and Vanessa for all of their many years of leadership. May your strength be theirs. Yet we come to a new page, Lord, in our walk with you in this church. And as a board, we ask God, your guidance be clear and certain that you will prepare the heart of the person you have planned. You're already speaking to them, Lord. You know what you have in store for us. And because it's from you, Lord, we know that it is going to be good. Thank you, Lord. So now, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Like David, Lord, our thirst is to be directed toward whatever you want for us. We place our hearts and our lives and our future in your hands and ask you to bless it. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good afternoon, or is it still morning? Still morning, amen. You know, the Lord has put on my heart. When I, I first came to this church and I was invited to, to preach by Pastor Mark, I told the story of my testimony story a little bit about the before I became a Christian, how that came about, and what has God been doing with my life since then. Don't worry, I'm not going to retell that story. But the story of our lives and the change that has happened is such an important story that it needs to be told. You all have a very unique and individual story to tell. I love the story and the way it's presented in the life of the Apostle Paul. He tells this story in Acts chapter 26. And as he tells this story in Acts chapter 26, he, he tells it to King Agrippa. And he tells it the before the reason for the change in his life or his conversion and then on to the life he lives as that changed person let me just read the the chapter for you so bear with me he finds himself imprisoned because of his faith and he has appealed to Caesar and he's on that journey to Caesar but on that road King Festus has to send a letter saying why he is needing to be um, why he's going to this court before Caesar 
he doesn't find anything really worth him being incarcerated and, and going, but he appealed, and because of that, he will go. So he writes this message, starting in verse 1 of chapter 26. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you may have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself a fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jews all know the way I have lived even ever be since I was a child. From the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem, they have known me for a long time. And they can testify, if they are willing, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. O king, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God rises the dead? I too was convinced that I thought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time, I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme in my obsession against them. I even went to the foreign countries to pursue them. On one of those journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority in commission of the chief priest. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The Lord replied, Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness that you may have seen of me in what I will show you, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven 
first to those in Damascus and then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the Gentiles also. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day. And so I stand here to testify to small and to great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead, would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. Are you out of your mind, Paul? He shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has happened, has escaped his notice, because it is not done in a corner, King Agrippa. Do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. The king arose, and, and with him the governor and Bernice, and those sitting with them. They left the room, and while talking with one another, they said, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Gripper said to Festus, this man would have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. What does the changed life look like? In first, excuse me, in Second Corinthians seventeen, Second uh, Corinthians five seventeen and eighteen. Let me let me read. Let me read this passage. Therefore, Paul says. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. A lot of people stop there, but I like to continue on to verse 18. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself, to Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, I, you can Google reconciliation. You don't even need a dictionary. It'll tell you right on your smartphone if you want to call it that. The restoration of friendly relations. Wow. I come from a large family. <laughs> I have many brothers and sisters, not quite as many as... as uh, Josh and his family have. But there have been times that uh, we didn't get along. Uh, there have been times that, that there has been division in the family where one doesn't talk to the other. You know, this changed life and this ministry of reconciliation says that's nonsense. It's time to put that aside. And in the power of Jesus Christ, we need to restore friendship. 
We need to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. As the song we sang earlier said, God so loved a sinner such as I. We need to embrace that. This is what Paul is teaching. This is why God sent Jesus to the cross to die, not in vain on that cross, but to bridge that gap to bring us to him. Forgiven, we can face God. God has given us that ministry of reconciliation. This is what this changed life in Christ needs to be. You see, God wants us to be like Jesus who lived on this life. And as, as man, he faced the trials and temptations and he was successful in living his life as the light that God wants him to be as a representation of, of who God is. Isn't that good news? You know, you are not stuck with your personality. <laughs> I'm not pointing no fingers except for myself. You are, you are not You are not condemned to a life of grumpy dumb. I don't think that's a word. Don't look it up. I, I make some up sometimes. But you know what I'm saying is there are far too many grumpy Christians out there. I'm sorry. You aren't called to be, oh, I might get myself in trouble. He might not ask me back. But you are not called to be a Christian jerk. That is not a ministry. I have then owned up a person that was involved in prison ministry. I was involved in Cairo's prison ministry there in El Centro, California. And we went to the state prison of Sentinella. The guy who was involved in, and became in charge and, and uh, opened the doors, you might say, with the pr prison administration and invited in the uh, Kairos prison ministry to minister in that, in that prison where we invited people to explore the changed life that God can, can bring about in people's lives. This man, um, it seemed like his ministry had a critical flaw in it, that he often, he often acted like a jerk. It came to the point that the prison officials um, were ready to take out his privileges to be there at prison because he often broke the rules. And, and prison's all about strict rules. You have to be where you're supposed to be. And, uh, and the prisoners watch everything you do. It got to the point where the prison officials started to question his, his Christian character. So we, as the council members, and I was serving as the, on the council, we had to make some, some hard decisions, and we confronted him. You know, and, and the Bible does say where sin abounds, grace all the more. 
But I, friends, I have a hard time finding anywhere in the Bible that God called us to continue to live in disobedience, continue to live in sin, continue to lie, continue to cheat, continue to disobey the authority just so that grace may abound. <laughs> I don't find that in Scripture. He often would say, that's just who I am. You have to accept me for who I am. No, no. God didn't save us in our sin just to continue to accept us to live in sin. No, he's called us to change. He's called us to live our life to be like Jesus. You're not stuck. In 1 Corinthians, let me, let me turn there real quick. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, you can read this. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. My friends, we are all tempted. We're all put on the spot. But I love this passage because it says, but when you are tempted, not if you're tempted. No, you're going to be tempted. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. There is victory in Jesus. Jesus managed to find the way out when he was tempted. You see, the problem is sometimes we get lazy and we don't look for the way out. We don't, we don't pray. We don't read the scriptures. We don't, we're not infused by the power of God, which we all have. We received all of the Holy Spirit when we accepted Jesus into our lives. But we need to tap into that power through prayer, through, through reading of his word, and through exercise and faith in our lives. God gives us a way out. Thing is, we have to look for it. So if you were born blank, if you were born fill in the blank, if you don't know what to fill in the blank, ask your spouse. Ask your significant other. Ask the person you're dating. I don't know. Ask them. They know who you are. They will tell you. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to die one. You don't have to die that fill in the blank. Because God's called you to change. God's called you and given you the power. He's given you the ability to be that new creation. Where did we ever get that, that idea in our head that we can't change? I think it's from the devil himself. That you're stuck in your sin that you were born that way, and it's in your DNA. I don't think there's a DNA thing that keeps you that way, but we can discuss that another day. No, according to Scripture, you can change. We are called to change. We may say it's just my nature to be that way, or I'm always pessimistic. That's just the way I am. In Proverbs 27, 17, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man will sharpen another. 
See, God, God has called us into accountability with one another. We should invite people into our lives that we trust, that can confront us and can be bold enough to say, God didn't call you to be a jerk, and it's time to change. That's that iron sharpening iron. I will tell you this, though. When iron sharpens iron, sparks may fly. <laughs> but is your love and your friendship strong enough to withstand the sparks? I pray that if God led that person into your life, it's because God wants some sparks to fly and change us. Embrace that. Say thank you because that is a friend indeed. Would we accept just the way we are when it comes to our bodies? I don't think so. You know, I was in a motorcycle accident, and yes, that's my motorcycle out front. I fell off the horse, and I got right back on. But there was a motorcycle accident somewhere along the journey of my life. And I shattered my right leg below the knee. There were 97 breaks before the doctor stopped counting. I was flown on a life flight from El Centro to Desert Regional Medical Center in Palm Springs, California. It's a trauma hospital. It's a teaching hospital. Has anyone here ever watched the movie uh, Dr. House? Come on. I mean, it's been off the air for a while. I think he needs to come back and solve the, in, in 30 minutes he could solve the coronavirus. Put him and his team and, and, and give him his Vicodin and, 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 and it'll, be, it'll be all gone in 30 minutes. I don't know whatever happened to Dr. House. He was an arrogant man as a doctor. The doctor that, that looked at the charts after I had arrived with my messed up broken leg came into my room because they just stabilized me and they, my leg was too swollen really to do anything at the time and they put it in a, a splint and one of those cast and he walked into the room and he grabbed my big toe and lifted my leg I went ay 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 at the top of my lungs and he looked at me like the jerk he was and and he said I did that because I heard you were a pastor and I said, okay. <laughs> he said, I wanted to see if you were going to curse at me. <laughs> I did it to the Jewish rabbi, too. And, and he said the same thing. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he says, most people just curse at me when I do that. I'm like thinking, you are a jerk. He says to me, he says, you have the most messed up leg I've ever seen. We reviewed this and had a meeting with the other doctors, and they recommend that we amputate your leg right below your knee. But I believe I can make you walk again. Man, it'd be easier just to 
to amputate. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's going to be a painful journey, but I believe I can have you walking again. I'd like you to let me and my team put you back together. And I said, okay, let's do it. I'm here walking today because of that arrogant, atheistic doctor. You know what he told me? He says, I know you're a Christian, and I want you to tell everyone it was me, Dr. Lewis, that got you walking again and not God. I don't want you to give the credit. I'm so tired of you Christians giving credit to God for what I do. Man, I tell you, he could have been the real Dr. House. I thought lightning was going to strike him dead in the room. I said, Dr. Lewis, why don't I do this? Why don't I just say, I'm so thankful that God made Dr. Lewis so smart that he was able to put my leg back together. He just huffed. He just said, I guess that's the best I can do with you. But what I, uh, I said that to say this is that God has difficult people that will come into our lives. But even the most difficult people that can come into your lives can be a blessing to you. And God wants you, when, when the difficult people grab you by the toe in life and lift up your foot and you're in pain, and he doesn't want you to revert back to your whole life and invent some cuss word. He wants you to live in the power of your testimony because of who you are. God, I sought the doctor's advice. and allowed him to fix my leg. I didn't just say, oh, my leg's messed up. That's just the way it is. I'll just live with this broken leg. No. I sought help. And it was a journey. We need to do the same thing with our hearts. We need to seek help from from Jesus Christ. And, And when Jesus went up to heaven, he says, I am going to leave you a comforter, a helper, and that is the Holy Spirit. And my friends, when you receive Christ into your heart, you receive the Holy Spirit, the helper. God in spirit that lives within us to help us find that way out in the midst of temptation. Shouldn't we seek help to aid us with our attitudes in life? Can't we request help or treatment for the selfish tendencies we have in life? Let me turn to Philippians chapter 4. 
verse 8. This is how we seek help. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, all right, or seen me, a scene in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Put into practice. Paul, oh, man, man, I guess, what? What confidence Paul had to say such a thing. Would any of us have the courage to challenge somebody or challenge a congregation, challenge our peers to say, whatever you have seen me do, put into practice. Now, you better be living the life before you say such a thing. This leads me to believe Paul lived that changed life, empowered. As when Jesus met Paul and he gave his testimony, he said, God spoke to him and said, I will give you the power. God gives us that power. God gives us that living Jesus in us through the Holy Spirit. I believe Jesus can change our hearts. I believe he wants to have each and every one of us to have a heart like his. I believe health care can be affordable because Jesus says, trust me, I have paid the price. Let us close with the, with the word. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Aren't you glad to be in church today? Isn't it a great day? great day. And I hope this isn't the last time that you hear this, but you go nowhere by accident, and wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose, and you are being there. Christ lives in you and has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go in the grace and love and power of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you guys are dismissed, and we're still asking that people leave and, and uh, go outside before you start to, to talk and whatnot, so uh, go ahead and do that.